I feel that we've been in this uh, business of deliverance for a long time now. There are still some areas that we haven't gotten around to touching on or teaching on in any detail or depth, but I think that in this study, or if we don't finish it tonight, part two of this, I think we're going to conclude the series on hands-on deliverance. We'll bring a conclusion to that either tonight or part two of this, just depending on how long it takes us to get through all of this. But I think that probably answers, you could go over the titles of all of the tapes thus far in this series, and I think that would basically deal with everything that we really need to know concerning hands-on deliverance. Now, there are various other questions. We haven't gotten into the uh, heredity issue because that's an issue that's really interesting, and we'll probably come to that real soon. I do want to deal with that. We haven't dealt with deliverance from your past or the remaining effects of your past. We haven't dealt in a lot of detail with uh, children and deliverance, which really is the same for me. I'll put it all together under the heredity question. There are a lot of Old Testament passages, you see, that we need to go to. Um, not just Exodus 20, one that may come to mind rather immediately, but there are a whole lot of different ones, and there are various arguments against some of the positions that people like ourselves have taken concerning the fact that demons, as well as a whole lot of other things, can pass down through the bloodline. I guess if eye color can, or whether you've got straight or curly hair, I mean, if mundane things like that can, I'm sure more important things can pass down as well. I think that people who study the medical profession and so forth, the people who study issues of heredity, they haven't even begun to touch the surface of what um, genes and human heredity are all about. We've got to remember we can't r trust all that we read in their textbooks. We have to take all of that with a grain of salt or maybe a dump load yeah. of salt, a dump truck load of salt, because maybe none of what they say is true. Or maybe they're onto something, but maybe they don't know it all. And we certainly haven't also dealt with another very important related issue that's found throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in all four of the Gospels, and that is the question of healing as it relates to demon possession. We know there are cases in the Bible as well as in our own lives and experience where people may have an identical condition and one of the two people needs deliverance and the other needs healing, or maybe one needs deliverance and healing and one only needs healing. So we'll just have to see what, what the Lord leads for in the future. But what I plan on doing now is wrapping up by answering a handful of final questions, some final practical questions. Some of them have come up in and throughout these teachings. Maybe some of them haven't been brought up specifically, but they're there. They're there nonetheless. And then if we don't get to your question, and you have one that I haven't thought of, then you can add it on. But these are important questions that I think we need to know something about whenever we are in the process of delivering someone from demon spirits. And we've had a whole lot of that going on around here lately. And I assume that that will continue until the Lord returns. Not necessarily casting demons out of all of us, but I don't find any hint in Scripture that any part of the commission has been retracted since it was given. Jesus, in the commission, he said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. So I assume that if, if that part of the commission is until the end of the age, and that's part of the commission, then the commission is till the end of the age. That's right. Everything there is applicable. And I don't read anywhere in the Bible that any of that's been taken back or retracted. Amen. So he said, go, and in my name, cast demons out. So I assume we'll be doing that until the Lord returns. Amen. Hallelujah. So we want to be prepared for these things. That's what our study is all about, to prepare us. So we'll trust the Lord to give us some more insight and instruction tonight. And I think it'll be easy to follow along because we're going to simply follow question by question. So let's start with the first question tonight. It's a rather big one, not only for you as the one who takes someone through deliverance, but you or someone you know as the one who's being delivered because if we're not clear in our mind as to the biblical scriptural answers to this question and the devil can sow some uh, doubt and discord in our mind and maybe cause us to lose what we had at one time, namely deliverance from him. So the question is this, what will a demon sound like whenever he talks? What will a demon sound like whenever he talks? So we're back to one of the last things we were dealing with, talking demons. 
What will a demon sound like when he talks? Now, well, see, I had my notes, it, when it talks, and so I'm quickly changing that, he, because it brings something else to my mind. I believe demons are male spirits. They're not men, but they're males, because I don't think we have any reference to any of God's female angels anywhere in the Bible. Think God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're not men, but as we taught you, where was that? In biblical lit on um, inclusive language? Yeah, I think that was where we brought things like that up, that God, um, his image is that of a male. There's no question about that. doesn't mean he has male bodily parts, but he has male characteristics. Of the chief being that he's an authority figure. I mean, he is an authority figure. He's so much of an authority figure, he's the creator and the sustainer and the judge of the universe. Lord. So I think that all of the angels of God are males. Now, I don't mean males as men, but I mean they have male characteristics. And, you know, just think in the Bible, whenever angels have appeared, they, and they've appeared in human form, it's always, and I talked with a man, or a man appeared to me. It's never a woman appeared to me. If it's a woman, it's probably a spirit masquerading as that, and it's not one of God's angels. They know better. They're not liars, you see. That's right. So are there any female demons? No, there aren't. Say, so what do you do if you've maybe read Brother Freeman's book, or you've read elsewhere his book angels of light what do you do with the incubi and succubi or singular and incubus and succubus these are kind of ancient terms that have reference to male and female quote unquote i'll explain what it means if you've never heard of that before spirits that attack men and women that is human beings sexually in sexual areas you ever heard of incubi and succubi yeah. it's a very real experience brother freeman's book deals with it very briefly i think it may be a paragraph in angels of light but you can read other material or you can talk to people who've had these experiences. I heard of someone again here just recently. I think it was maybe today or yesterday or heard about someone in a very dramatic type uh, episode. If I remember the story correctly, the woman, it was a woman. She was a Christian as far as I know, charismatic as far as I know. And she had had, uh, let's don't digress into where she's coming from or why, but she had had some surgery that prohibited her from experiencing normal relations with her husband. And so not knowing the word of God, we can tell she doesn't know the word or she wouldn't have submitted to surgery. But she was a charismatic Christian like a lot of people are out there. And so not knowing the word of God and not being able to have normal relations with her husband, she began to experience, she thought it was from God until she was alerted to the fact that God doesn't send angels to do things like that. She began having experiences with an invisible creature, a spiritual creature, yet she could feel it, that would give her the feelings of marital relationships. Now, it was invisible. She didn't see anything, but it happened. And we're in the charismatic church, so none of you are going to poo-poo that idea because they will elsewhere. Like, I don't know. I can't handle stuff like that. Like, Amen. well, well, it happens, you see. And you try to tell people that it's happened to her, I don't believe that. And, and that's why people like that end up in mental institutions because no one will believe the stories that they tell. Uh, can you imagine the, the Mark 5 man trying to tell somebody today what his experience was yesterday or last night? You know what I did the last couple of weeks? I've been roaming around cutting myself. Well, he would end up in an institution because people wouldn't say, you know what? I believe you. That's what we would say if someone told us, let me tell you my experience. You're probably not going to believe it. It's so bizarre. We'd be saying, tell me, tell me. I'm going to believe it. <laughs> tell me, I believe you. And when they said, demons attacked me, and I used to live in an underground tomb, <laughs> we'd say, I believe you. I believe you. I'm not going to say that you're crazy. The spirit in you is a crazy demon, but you're not crazy. You're probably normal. You're probably normal before the spirit came in you. And I've got an answer for you, and it's deliverance in Jesus' name. It's not being, it's not being sent away to a loony farm, lunatic farm, where the loony birds go. But... This woman didn't know enough about God or the Bible or spiritual matters to know that God would not send her Gabriel or Michael, you know, one of the angels, to satisfy her female desires. That is a spirit. 
So you say, well, we have no problem. She being a woman would necessitate a male spirit. Well, I forget which is which. Incubi, succubi doesn't make any difference. But the same thing has happened with men. The same thing has happened with men. Charismatic, sometimes charismatic Christian men where they have a spirit that maybe manifests physically or maybe it doesn't appear in any visible way, but it does the same thing I just said earlier. And that has led maybe some people, if not to form a theology, I doubt that's true, it's maybe led them to be a little off in their thinking, assuming that there are female demons. I don't think there's any such thing as a female demon. Because remember, whatever the demons are, God didn't create them a demon. He created them good spirits, whatever God made. Whenever he looked out and beheld everything, it was very good. His evaluation of his world in Genesis 1.31 was it's very good. Everything that God made was very good. And so we're going to have to say that whatever this is, this, this demon that is a woman now, used to be a woman angel or a woman spirit or a woman whatever in heaven at one time. And we don't have any support for that in the Word. So I would simply say it's a male spirit masquerading as a female. I mean, that's easy. That's, that's their whole purpose, to come as an angel of light and deceive a person. So they are imitating a female. They're masquerading as one. They're posing as one. But there are no such thing as female demons. I don't know if you've ever run into, I hope nobody in our body's ever had that experience. Uh, if you have, I hope it's past tense, back in your lost days. I hope not as a charismatic Christian. But I don't know if any of you have ever run into people who've had these incubi, succubi experiences. It doesn't seem to be just real common out there, but you want to be alerted to it, so if you ever hear about it or have to deal with someone in this area, you won't think that they're crazy. Amen. You won't say, well, I, I think you just dreamed that up. Right. That really has happened on occasions. Like a male, a man, uh, he was a Christian uh, that I heard of one time who had lost his wife, I think, in an automobile accident and for whatever reason couldn't remarry or wasn't remarried and so in order to relieve himself of his sexual tensions he believed that god had sent him a female angel to minister to him well you know people are just so shallow they're so gullible i guess is the word they'll believe any experience that they have that's why charismatics really have to be worn in areas like this non-charismatics they wouldn't believe it they'd run to the psycho a head shrinker Charismatics who are open for spiritual experiences, and we should be, uh, must not be gullible, though. So I got off on all, that's not even a question we were going to bring up tonight, but I got off on that by saying, what will a demon sound like when it, or he, or she, manifests itself? Because you can hear demons coming out of men that have feminine voices. So I guess we are relating it to what we're studying right now in the first question here. Let's say that it is a feminine voice, and it's a... Uh, distinctly feminine voice coming out of a man does that mean that the demon is a female no it's a male spirit masquerading as a female spirit all right so back to the question what will a demon sound like in other words will it have its own voice or will it sound like the person that it possesses in other words you recognize me i mean i could be invisible up here or hide behind the pulpit and just start talking you know that's brother ross and if somebody else talked and said they were brother ross you wouldn't believe that because you know what he sounds like and i know what you sound like we all have our distinct way of speaking and enunciating so we're asking a very important question here and you'll see as we go along maybe how important this question is what will the demon sound like what should you be expecting if you've got this one out of 20 cases where you can get the demon speaking, the demon is actually a talking demon. Well, they're all talking demons, but this one happens to be in the mood to talk this day. Will it have its own voice, or will it sound like the person it possesses? Well, let me just give this to you the way the Lord seems to have given this to me. It can be either or both of the above. However, I believe that if it sounds like the person that it possesses, in other words, we can recognize through the blasphemies or whatever it is they're uttering, or maybe it's not that extreme, maybe it's something a lot less than that, we can recognize the person's voice because we know the person, and yet they're uttering things like, you know, I'm going to cast this demon out, and the person with their own voice says, no, you're not going to cast me out. 
And it's not a foreign sound, it's that person's own sound. We would recognize that under any other circumstance. We'd recognize, we recognize it now. I believe probably in a case like that, although I don't think that we ought to get really uh, deep into trying to make some distinction here, I believe in a case like that, we don't actually have the demon talking, but the demon is anointing or inspiring or directing the person to do the speaking. And we can have that, and that's just as legitimate manifestation of the presence and activity of demon spirits as if they assume a voice entirely distinct from the person they are possessing. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? We're making a, a difference here between the two. Uh, I guess on the tape that you heard last week, we heard various voices come out of this woman, some of them more masculine sounding, and I guess maybe most of them definitely more feminine sounding. But I heard on that uh, a voice that just sounded bizarre, like it didn't belong to the woman. And I heard a voice that was saying, I won't come out, I won't come out. At the same time, the woman was going, oh, and I can't go, oh, I won't come out at the same time. Now, I can do one, then the other, and then back and forth. I can jump back and forth, but I can't say them at the same time. So I think what you heard from that tape was a demon talking. You say, well, how do demons talk? Well, how does the earth turn on its axis? I mean, how does anything happen? Demons just talk. They're as much a being and a personality as you are. They're probably more real than you are. They're more powerful than you are. They can stand on their head and walk on their head, go through doors, go wherever, jump in a fire, jump in the lake, not drown. They're more powerful than you are. So I don't think you have anything over on them, not in intelligence, not in mental capacity, not in strength, not in power, not in personality, not in the ability to utter intelligible speak and language, speech and language. They know how to speak. They know how to talk. They are spirits. They don't have to have what we think that you have to have, something that, we, that can be cut out of you by a surgeon and looked at, you know, the insides of your chest and your throat and tongue and teeth and mouth in order to speak, and they can still speak. So we can have either or both of the above. When we ask the question, what will a demon sound like? It can e either have its own voice or it will sound like the person it possesses, but if it's the latter of those cases, I think what we have on our hands is the fact that the demon is simply directing, guiding, inspiring that person to bring forth that utterance. Then if you ask, well, how can you, we explain, I mean, how can a demon inspire a person to bring forth that utterance? Well, the, in the same way that the demon can inspire that person to have the problems that they have, that they've come to us for deliverance over. They don't want the problems that they have. They don't want hearing voices in their mind. Uh, they don't want uh, the lust thoughts that they have or whatever. How do they get those? A demon inspired them. A demon is directing their thoughts or directing their life in such a way that their life is manifesting or bringing these things forth. So I think, in other words, we have a very real manifestation of demon spirits in a deliverance service, even if all we hear in the talking is the person's voice that we would otherwise recognize. Now, this happens on many occasions whenever the demons manifest, and, and we want to be sensitive to that. We don't want to just think, now, I'm not going to believe that I've, I've got a manifestation, or I'm not going to believe that I've heard a demon, or I'm not going to believe that a demon has talked unless I hear out of this 5'1", 87-pound woman, this huge, deep, masculine voice, or vice versa, out of a man, a high-pitched feminine voice. Those are the extremes. Demons certainly aren't trying to hide behind anything there. I mean, even an unsaved person should recognize we got a personality disorder on our hands here, a demonic presence here. When you've got a 285-pound man speaking in a very high-pitched voice just like a woman, Men, if they're normal, can't speak like women, not even if they raise their voice up really high. They just can't sound like a woman. If they can, they, there's something wrong with them. And essentially the same is true with women. Now, some women <laughs> don't be registering each other's voices now to check each other out here. Some women maybe have a little deeper, a little higher voice than other women. Same is true with men. We've got men here in the church. Some are deeper and some are a little higher and some are in between. But women don't speak like men. Men don't speak like women.
If you've got a man's voice coming out of a woman or a woman's voice out of a man, you've got a demon talking. But what I'm trying to set forth for all of our benefit here is, you know, that's, that's the easy side. That's easy to deal with. If, you know, if you've got a child there and uh, it's screaming its head off with another voice, you know, you've got a demon. That's easy to deal with. What about you, if you've got talking manifestations and it sounds just like the person that you would recognize otherwise? I want to make sure that we don't sweep that under the rug or we don't maybe fail to take note of something that could be a manifestation of the presence of demon spirits. As a matter of fact, I could even maybe say something else here. Whenever you are delivering someone, you ought to just pay attention, if the person does speak, to what they have to say. Because it may just come across in a real soft, non-combative way. And if you're discerning, the Lord may show you, now that's not the person talking, that's that demon speaking. You know, it's a demon inspiring the person, it's that demon speaking. Now I've said to you before, it's, I think it's best, generally speaking, to get the person being delivered quiet so the demons can have the opportunity to manifest. Uh, but uh, of course you've got to maybe sometimes ask them a question or sometimes they just have something to say anyway. Sometimes you're not asking them a question and they just pipe up and have something to say. And you don't hear any strange voices. You'd recognize Tom or Mary because you've heard them before. And you've just got to be discerning that maybe there's no shift in the tone or the pitch of the voice, but just maybe if you're discerning, the Lord wants to show you that's not that person talking. That's the demon talking. Sometimes I read one minister say this, that the Lord led him, in certain cases, he had led, led, lead him directly in, in this way. Son, whatever you hear after this point in the session, take it being from a demon. Now that helps. That's a big help if the Lord says that to you. Whatever else you hear, it's not the person talking. It doesn't matter how much it sounds like them. It's simply not the person talking. And I want to give you another analogy in parallel. If any of you need some extra proof to quiet your mind or to satisfy your beliefs in this area. How about whenever we're baptized in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives us the utterance of speaking in tongues? Does it sound like a foreign voice? If it does, it's not the Holy Spirit. There's one great distinction between being baptized in the Spirit and being possessed by a demon, and that is the Holy Spirit doesn't possess you. He fills you, but he doesn't possess you and control you and utter strange and other voices out of you. When you speak in tongues, guess whose voice you speak in? Your own. Amen. And yet when we say, well, I don't believe that's of God, or I don't believe that's spiritual, or I don't believe that's from a spirit. It is from the Holy Spirit. Amen. We don't question that at all. Amen. It's our utterance, but it's the Holy Spirit giving us the utterance. Why can't we flip that over and the same thing be true in demon possession? When that person's saying, no, or I don't like you, and it's no strange voice, or I hate you, or I'm going to kill you, or leave me alone, or I'm tired, or let's just call this quits, call it quits and stop now, and we don't hear any strange voices, maybe that's still a demon inspiring them to utter those words. We've got to be discerning whenever we're in a deliverance session and we have any talking, whether it's the demon talking with his own distinct voice or whether it's the voice of the individual. I think that either one of those things could be the case. Now, that would be rather difficult to prove from Scripture, to demonstrate from Scripture, because Scripture is a written document. We would need something that's audio. You know, you really couldn't, prove a lot from scripture i know we have a lot of cases where we've got the demon talking quote unquote but is it well it's a demon talking but you'd have to have been there and listened to it and then known the man or the girl's voice to know is this a different voice or not otherwise there's no way we could distinguish in the bible we'd have to have this on cassette and we don't have that on cassette we have it well you can buy it on cassette uh, but we don't have it that way for instance if you turn over to acts 19 because some of you may be thinking, well, I know a lot of places where demons talk in the Bible. Well, I do too. 
But are you going to be able to show me in these places whether or not, I mean, prove to me whether or not it's the demon talking with a distinct voice or it's the demon speaking through the man or the girl or the woman's voice? I don't think there's any way you're going to be able to prove one way or the other. So maybe we have some cases of it being one way and some cases being the other. Acts 19, there were seven sons of this man. And the evil spirit answered and said, well, we know it's the evil spirit, but is he using the person's speaking ability or is the demon just speaking out of their hollow belly? You see, demons don't always use the vocal apparatus of an individual whenever they speak. A demon may kind of sound like they're coming from maybe kind of the left of the person's head or maybe the right of their stomach. The, the voice is kind of coming from that area, that direction. What about that tape I brought for you last week? We've got a woman moaning, and at the same time demons are talking. You can't do both of those. Not with the mechanisms God has given you. So I would assume that the woman is the one doing the moaning. The spirits are even inspiring that. And the demons talk. I don't know if the, de if the sound came from the woman's face or it came from her belly, or it came from her right side, or her left side. The demons could have talked from down around the knee area, I guess. You could have heard the voice coming from down there. It wouldn't have had to come out of the woman's mouth or something. So the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, it's a talking demon. And Paul, I know, it's an intelligent demon. But who are ye? And that's the end of the talking, and then you get into the fighting after that, verse 16. So I hope that will clarify any questions you might have had on the sound of a demon, the sound of a demon. Demons can sound rather horribly and terribly whenever they speak, but they can also sound rather recognizable and normal if they are simply inspiring the person to speak and we recognize that as being the person. All right, I'm going to go on to another question if you don't have any on that, if that's clarified enough in our mind. Uh, remember uh, one of the teachings on uh, demons need holes in your body to get in and out? Or when that, that's not true for speaking? Uh, no, not know? necessarily. No, not necessarily. Because remember the old ancient art of ventriloquism. Um, and the book of Isaiah speaks of peeping and muttering where sounds would actually... Um, sound as though they've been uttered from another part of the room maybe or another direction there have even been cases in demon possession whereas they are delivering a person I, I thought of this earlier but I just decided not to say it because I thought someone might raise this question if I did uh, where they're delivering someone over in the one corner of the room and those voices begin coming from the other corner now, I'm not going to get all bound up and trying to identify now. Are the demons really over there? Or are they practicing that, that, that art that they are experts at and they're throwing their voice over there? You know, that's what ventriloquism is. It's supposed to be coming from one area, but it's being thrown into another area. Are they really coming out of the person's belly or out of their mouth and throwing it over there? You see, it seems like, and I think I've said this before, that whenever demons possess a person, this is kind of a wholesale general statement, they possess in the belly area. They possess in the chest or in the belly area. And that's why, I, at least in my readings and things, I've come across the fact that demons sometimes sound as though they're coming out of the hollows of a person's stomach, almost as though you could hear echoes. And you're saying, well, you know, where's that coming from? It's coming right out of the hollow stomach of the individual, as though you're hearing echoes down there. And so the sound is just kind of vibrating and reverberating in the room. And you can't really locate it as to one source, such as the mouth. Are uh, talking birds, are they demons, or are they just... Are they I don't believe so. That's an interesting related question, though, isn't it? I don't believe so. We've even got one native here in this country, the Carolina parrot, but... He was slaughtered in the 1800s, and I don't think there are any more of those around. He's an extinct bird now. He's too pretty. If you're too pretty, you get killed, especially if women like your feathers and their hats. And if you taste good, which the Carolina parrot did, and if you destroy the crop of corn. Well, you say, what's that have to do with it? Well, that's a little of my bird knowledge just seeping out there. 
That's one of our extinct birds. Some people believe that there's a remote possibility that the Carolina parrot, some people call it a parakeet, it's a beautiful bird. You know, you, you probably thought that parrots came from South America or, or wherever. Well, they do now, but they used to come from this country. Beautiful green and yellow and orange, big, long parrots with long tails and everything. But some people think that we might have one or two rare ones lost somewhere in the swamps of the South, but no one's ever seen one, though. They perished back in, I think, 1860 or 1880 was the last of those. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I know a lot about birds. Sometimes it's, it's easy just to illustrate with a bird story. I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate with one more bird story, if you don't mind. Like, you know, we always hear about God's protection and his providential watching over and care of the animal kingdom out there with the illustration of a robin. I've even used that illustration myself before, where whenever you're wanting to go fishing, you can dig all day with a bulldozer and never find a worm. But whenever that robin wants one, he could find one in asphalt if he had to. I mean, he can find a worm anywhere under any conditions, raining, sunshine, heavy equipment around him. No one knows whether it's hearing, vibration, or just a 19th sense that he has where he knows there's a worm here. And he leans his head back and forth, and then he backs up and yanks that big, long night crawler right out of the earth. Well, there are many examples like that in the bird kingdom. There's one woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker, who has an uncanny ability to know in a perfectly good forest, none of us would ever recognize it, which tree, he can fly by and he'll know it, which tree contains an ant colony, you know, carpenter ants that are inside the bark that are running up and down the tree. He doesn't see them as far as we know he doesn't. He can be flying by through the woods. And he has an uncanny ability to not only locate the tree, but he can zero in, hone in immediately on the first peck, right in the dead center of that colony. No one knows how to explain things like that. You know, we peel the bark off and look, and we wouldn't know where to start. You know, left hand, right hand, north, south side of the tree. But that woodpecker knows. That's their favorite food, carpenter ants, and they know how to find them. They can go through a forest and just right into that tree. And it looks like a good tree as far as you're concerned. For the continuation of the... And it looks like a good tree as far as you're concerned. And they can go right into the center of that ant colony. Well, I think we explain that not by evolution. <laughs> or why doesn't a robin do that? But that's the way God takes care of Amen. his creation. All right, praise God. Let's go on to a second point then. That is the question, should we lay hands on someone when we cast demons out? Various views on this in deliverance circles. Should we lay hands on someone when we cast demons out? Now, some people say no. Some people in deliverance circles say no, and their caution is based on, among other passages, ones like 1 Timothy 5, 22, where Paul said to Timothy, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. We know that charismatics sometimes as a whole are all too ready and maybe too prone to have hands laid on them and to lay hands on other people. And so it's good that we have some teaching in Scripture like in the book of Genesis, like in Genesis uh, chapter 47 and Hebrews chapter 6 and so forth, uh, the power of the laying on of hands is a part of the Christian doctrine. Things are transmitted by the laying on of hands. And so with that in mind, Paul gives a warning in 1 Timothy 5.22 not to lay hands suddenly on any man. And I would assume that the reverse would be true. Don't allow any man to indiscriminately or hastily or without proper caution lay hands on you and so there are just a few people I don't think that they are in the majority um, in the charismatic movement because of what I just said they're all too ready to lay hands and have hands laid on them but there are a few people in the charismatic movement who because of their caution based on 1st Timothy 522 are perhaps a little too cautious and they say that you should not lay hands on people whenever you cast demons out Say, what's the reason? The reason being, you may pick up the spirit that you're trying to cast out of them. If you're casting it out, the spirit has to go somewhere, and what better place to go than into you, the one doing the de delivering by touch and transmission. You touch, and a spirit's transmitted to you. If you turn over to Mark 16, I could even add in here to help their argument out a little bit that you could probably try to use Mark 16 verses 17 to 18 and build a case 
for the no laying on of hands doctrine in deliverance areas. Mark 16, verses 17 to 18. In conjunction with some other things that we've said. Notice in verse 17, we read, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast, they shall cast out demons in my name. Amen. They shall cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink poison. Into verse 18, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In other words, I'm saying that these people could really turn to Mark 16, 17, and 18 and try to build a case for no laying on of hands. They could say the laying on of hands is relegated to the issue of divine healing, according to Mark 16, 18, B. Whereas the in Jesus' name and the spoken word cast out directs itself to the general area of deliverance, according to verse 17. You see what I'm saying here? Cast out in Jesus' name is for deliverance. Lay hands on the sick is for divine healing. It didn't say lay hands on those who have demons. It says in Jesus' name cast them out. And it says lay hands on those who are sick. Well, that's certainly true here in Mark 16, but we've got to take the whole revelation, though. And we certainly have, in other places of the New Testament, healing being practiced without the laying on of hands simply by the spoken word of faith. For instance, in Luke chapter 17 and verse 14, I think this is the case of the lepers. Jesus simply told them to go show themselves to the priests. And as they went, they saw that they were healed. He didn't lay hands on them, or we're not told that he did in Luke 17, 14. There are many, many other cases, like in John chapter 5 and verse 8. Jesus has the man who has had this infirm condition for many, many years, John 5 and verse 8. And he simply said, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. And he did just that, without the laying out of hands. In other words, I'm saying, although Mark 16 said lay hands on the sick, that's not an absolute thing. Or Jesus would have always laid hands on the sick, and he didn't. There were times where he spoke the word of faith. And the word of faith, the spoken word of faith, was enough to heal the person without the laying on of hands. So in other words, we've kind of flipped part of that Mark 16 doctrine on his head and seen that the reverse is also true. Laying on of hands for the sick, yes. Spoken word of faith without the laying on of hands for the sick, yes. Both of those found. So, back to Mark 16. Mark 16, 17. We don't have any reference to the laying on of hands for deliverance. We simply have, in Jesus' name, you cast them out. However, in other scriptures, we do have reference to the laying on of hands in the area of demon possession. Let me give you a few of these passages, and there are not very many of them. I can only think of a couple, by the way. Uh, for instance, in Luke chapter 4, you're going to have to unite this scripture with another one. Luke chapter 4, verses 38 and 39. Luke 4, 38 and 39. We're going to join that with Mark 1, verses 30 and 31. Mark 1, 30 and 31. We'll look at Luke first, followed by Mark. We join them because there are parallel passages and each supplies information that the other doesn't. This will set forth our answer to the second question that we're on. Should we lay hands or let's, let's rephrase it for right now. Can we ever lay hands on someone to cast demons out? Well, we certainly can because it's practiced in Scripture. Luke 4, 38, and he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now, you might ask, well, I don't see any laying on of hands there. Well, that's right, because Luke doesn't tell us the whole story. Mark's going to mention laying on of hands. You say, well, that'd be fine and good, but I also don't see anything about deliverance or demons here. 
Well, then you missed something. He stood over her and rebuked the fever. Now, fever, F-E-V-E-R, can't hear you. I mean, what's fever? Fever is a high temperature. Fever can't hear you. How can you rebuke fever? Well, let me add in some more. Maybe I'm not uh, being clear enough or, or complete enough. Th this term rebuke here is a term whenever it's used in the New Testament. It's always used as an address to a personality. Jesus rebuked demons. It's the same term. We know on one occasion, more than one, Jesus rebuked the wind. Well, wind, W-I-N-D, can't hear you. Wind is just wind. Now, if there's a spirit, namely the devil, behind that wind on that Sea of Galilee trying to fill that boat with water and kill Jesus and the apostles prematurely, if there's a spirit behind that wind, then you could say properly that you rebuked the wind, you talk to the wind, you address the wind, you spoke to the wind, not because wind can hear you, but the spirit behind it can. So he rebuked the fever. Why? Because fever is a spirit. Over in Mark chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, you'll have the additional confirmation that the laying on of hands was practiced here. Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever and immediately they tell him of her and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. That's the laying on of hands. I mean, it's touch. He touched her. You don't have to have it said uh, he laid hands on her simply by virtue of the fact he touched her, virtue went out of him and healed her or drove that spirit out or both, we could say. Remember all it took in a chapter four later than this in Mark five was for that woman to touch the hem of his garment and she was made whole. She felt within her body that she was whole of that plague. So he took her by the hand, lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them. But if you want really a clearer scripture than, than joining those two together, we have one over in Luke chapter 13 verses 11 and following. Luke chapter 13, verses 11 and following. We have a clearer scripture here. Now, I'm going to make a concluding point about this, though. This question, should we lay hands on someone to cast demons out? I'm obviously saying along the way that, yes, that's scriptural to do that. In other words, the people who say, no, you cannot lay hands on because 1 Timothy 5.22 warns against that. If you lay hands on someone, you might get a spirit. Well, with that belief and confession you may just get a spirit so i guess you better not lay hands on but i wouldn't be believing i'm going to get one Amen. if that's what you're believing for then you're right i wouldn't lay hands on someone if i felt i'm afraid to lay hands i might pick up the spirit as it comes out of them well you better not lay hands on them but i know really what they're asking more deeply here is is it biblical is it scriptural or not well let's read what Luke tells us in Luke 13 and verse 11, Behold, there was a woman. Now, what did she have? She had a demon. A spirit, just another word for a demon. Right. This was an infirm spirit. That's a passage we'll use later on. We talk about deliverance and healing. She had a spirit that caused a certain physical ailment or infirmity in her body. It wasn't like a spirit of insanity or something. It was a mental problem. It was a physical one. She had a demon of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together just like a person would bow over. She was just bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. How do you like that? And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. I believe, you see, that we have all these stories that the Holy Spirit has given to us through the writings of the apostles for a reason, because they give us various clues, various insights, various tidbits of information uh, as to the practices we should follow in our ministry, whether it's a faith ministry, healing ministry, teaching ministry, deliverance ministry. Jesus did it all, working of miracles ministry, raising the dead ministry. I think that there are these passages in Scripture and that they're here for a reason. Now, the denominational commentators would say, well, you shouldn't build too much on this. Well, the problem with that logic is what you're saying is you shouldn't build too much on the holy, infallible Word of God. Amen. Even if it's just a comma, if it's inspired in there, that's the Word of God. 
What do you mean we shouldn't build too much on there? How can you build too much on God or His Word? Amen. How can you build too much? You know, building too much, what the picture they're trying to say is you've got a big, huge doctrine here, and you've got a little, little, tiny foundation underneath that. In other words, the foundation won't support the doctrine. Well, if the foundation's not in the Bible, then yes, the foundation won't support the doctrine. But if the foundation's in the Bible, the foundation is, by definition of the nature of God Amen. and His Word, bigger than anything you could ever build on top of it. All you'd need is a half of a verse, not a one verse or a whole sentence, just a half a sentence. And if it's an expression of the mind and will and purpose of God, you can't get any bigger than God. Amen. You can never build a building bigger than the foundation. Amen. All right. So that's enough of a foundation right there. One scripture is enough. One scripture is enough. He laid his hands on a woman who was demon possessed. One scripture is enough for that. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. So that, that was a principle I'm setting forth for you right there and in interpreting other things in the Word of God. It makes a lot of sense to me. What do you mean building too much on that? If you mean that you are out of alignment with some other scripture, well then, all right, then we better check the rest of the Word of God. But generally what they mean is they just want to take that verse away because maybe that's the only one that will support our truth. So they want to take that away from us. That's the devil behind that. He's a de Amen. deceiver and seducer and a liar. That's right. The reason they're saying we're building too much on that passage is because that's probably about the only one that we have. And they don't want us to be able to build anything on that. So they say, you're building too much on that. Well, you can't be building too much on the Bible. Amen. Not if it's in the Bible. Now, if it's your reconstruction, then yes, you're building. If it's in the Bible, you can't be building too much on that. Oh. And we're no ignoramuses, and we're no group of people that just try to find one verse and then throw the rest of the Bible away. We're, our whole life is involved in constantly putting together the whole counsel, the whole revelation, the whole Word of God. So, so with that in mind, let me say this then. Concerning many cases of healing in the Word of God, in Jesus' ministry and in the ministry of the apostles, we see, or the church at large we could say, we see the laying on of hands practiced. Concerning the casting out of demons, we don't see a whole lot of references. Now, you don't want to build everything on statistics, on percentages there, but we need to even let the percentages speak to us. So you can lay hands on those. I think what probably we should have emphasized, what the Bible is emphasizing for us, is the fact that, yes, you can lay hands on someone and cast a demon out. It was done by the Lord here in uh, Luke 13, 13. But what we need to keep in mind is the primary emphasis. Here's what I want to underscore for you. The primary emphasis in deliverance is the spoken word of faith where you say, come out in Jesus' name. And I'll tell you why I believe that's true. It's because in deliverance, unlike in healing, you're dealing with another personal entity, a personality. This is a deeper insight that I believe that the Lord is giving us. I've never heard this anywhere else. So I believe it's a deeper insight that we get if we be open to Scripture and say, well, let's look at the various cases that we have and where is the burden of the evidence and the bulk of the proof. Amen. We can't rule out laying on of hands. You may want to lay hands on all the time. But I think that we should remember when we're laying hands on people for deliverance that unless there's a special anointing in our hands to lay hands on them, Go ahead and lay hands on them anyway. But the primary emphasis is on that spoken word of faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. You come out of her or him. Whenever we're practicing divine healing on someone, when a spirit is not resonant there causing that, then although we certainly are to speak the word of faith, and the word of faith is productive, there is a rather large emphasis based right on the commission, Mark 16, 18, you shall lay hands on the sick. That's right. That there's an emphasis on the laying on of hands because as you lay hands on them, the Holy Spirit brings something through your laying on of hands into their body which cures them of that disease. Amen. So it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit through your hands that destroys that disease in their body. You're not dealing with the personality there. Therefore, all the talking and addressing is not as important. The personal addresses are not as important as what you'll find in deliverance areas. Now, do you understand what I'm talking about there? Amen. Does that make sense Amen. to you? Amen. Remember Mark 16. He said, you'll cast demons out. 
You'll cast them out in Jesus' name. When it comes to sickness, he said, you shall lay hands on the sick. The difference being, in one case, we're dealing with a personality who needs to be talked to. You talk to them in Jesus' name and say, come out in Jesus' name. Uh, you don't just lay hands on and meditate. Jesus doesn't say do that. He says to cast them out. And to cast them out, you've got to say, I cast you out. Amen. How do you cast out but say, I cast you out? You've got to tell them to go. Whereas in the laying on of hands, there is an anointing in the hands. And the disease is driven away. Now, remember, the Bible keeps all of that in balance. You can also just speak the word of faith to a person who needs healing and not lay hands on them because there are cases of that in the Bible. And you can also, uh, Luke 13, 13, lay hands on people who need deliverance. So maybe these people who have said we should not lay hands on people for deliverance, maybe you see the Lord had them on a certain truth in a certain area, but they took it to an extreme and got a little lopsided because the scripture doesn't support this wholesale ruling out any laying on of hands in cases of deliverance because we've got Luke 13, 13. Maybe they were onto something there, though. Um, if they weren't, I'll, I'll just kind of put them onto something, and that is that our emphasis in deliverance should be that spoken word of command, the authority that we have with our voice in Jesus' name come out. Whereas although that's also true in divine healing, we need to remember that Jesus said, go lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. Uh, I don't think he just means there, just lay hands on them and just smile and don't say anything. You probably better say, I rebuke this sickness or this condition of blindness, I command it to go, or this condition of uh, stomach trouble, I command it to cease now and to be gone, or whatever you are anointed to say. So there's question number two. Questions on that. No, I, I would say that there again, are, we've got a case where, where the scriptures give both, and I would say the evidence is probably more evenly divided there. There is the laying on of hands, and there is the spontaneous reception of the Holy Spirit. Um, I believe that people can actually have a gift of imparting the Holy Spirit to other people. I believe that could be true. And uh, if that's the case, then I think hands need to be laid on. Again, just because this is one of those situations where I'm always having to digress and say what I don't mean, just to make sure you understand what I do mean. Uh, again, if you don't have that gift, it would still be legitimate to lay hands on someone to receive the Holy Spirit. But uh, like if you read Brother Freeman's books real carefully, I forget which one, maybe it's in two of them. He tells some stories in um, How to Know God's Will that are found elsewhere. I don't know if they're on tape or in book, but maybe it's in Charismatic Body Ministry where he talks about praying for some people to receive the Holy Spirit in one, I think, denominational setting. And he came to the first person in the line after promising them in a probably an hour and a half message, God wants to pour his spirit out here. God's going to baptize you in the spirit. You're going to speak in tongues with the evidence. And so he gets a line of people up there and he lays hands on the first one and, and tells them to receive the Holy Spirit and nothing happens. Well, so you don't know what to do. So you go on to the next person, you lay hands on the second one, nothing happens. The third one, and about that time, you see, the devil's really wrestling with you in your mind, saying, look at here, you're going to be a failure and a flop, and the lack of receiving in these first few people, that's discouraging everybody else here in the church. Any faith that was present is quickly going down the drain. So we got to that fourth person, and he didn't waste any time. He didn't lay hands on. He just said, speak in the name of Jesus. And he had to have a strong word of faith in And immediately, I think it was a young man, just burst out in tongues. And that broke what the devil was trying to hinder there. And as a result, he went on, prayed for the rest of them, and then went back and prayed for the first ones. And they all received a speaking in tongues. But that laying out of hands wasn't doing any good right there. You see, the devil was hindering him in a particular area there so he could stop anybody in that entire church receiving the Holy Spirit. So what he needed was a real anointed word from the Holy Spirit, and he got it. He just said, speak in the name of Jesus. He didn't say, be filled with the Spirit. He just said, talk right now in Jesus' name. And they started talking in tongues. And that was a command of faith, and it broke the devil's power there. But like in Acts 2, they received without the laying on of hands. In Acts 10, without the laying on of hands. In Acts 8, with the laying on of hands. In Acts 9, with the laying on of hands. 
there is split 50-50 right there without jumping over to Acts 19 and telling you what they did over there. But the apostles came down so they could, in Samaria, lay hands on those Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Spirit. I think maybe what we'll learn through this all, and some of you, you've not been in this or you've not been practicing enough or you've not looked for opportunities or created opportunities or believed for opportunities enough that you don't know. It kind of sounds mystical, although you agree 100% with what you hear me say sometimes. That you, whenever you're in situations, you have to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's such a little cliche. We can say, yeah, I believe that. And then whenever you get in it, then you don't listen. Now, what is the Holy Spirit saying? Is he leading me to lay hands on or to speak a word of faith? He may just want to lead you in a certain direction. And if you'll listen and learn and then be obedient and follow and practice that, you'll be much, much, much more effective than someone who just charges in where angels fear to tread knocking doors down everywhere doing what they think is the right pattern there may be a pattern in scripture but then there may be times where we don't follow the pattern but we follow the exception well i think i've got enough time maybe to discuss one more of these questions and we'll have to leave the others for another study this is question number three then Another important question that has been raised, can demons be cast out by the proxy method? By the proxy method. P-R-O-X-Y. Now, do we all know what proxy means except the children? <laughs> proxy means the person needing healing or deliverance, whichever the case is not present. And so you pray with someone or something else. I guess where you see that term proxy maybe more often than anywhere else is whenever you own some stock and you receive something in the mail that they're going to be voting and so you send in your little slip and say you're going to vote by proxy because everybody can't come to national headquarters in Memphis or Nashville or whatever of that company and so if you can't be there you vote by proxy and so you send your anointed ballot back in. <laughs> You lay hands on it, anoint it, and check what you believe, and so you vote by proxy. In other words, you're not there. They don't get your yay or nay or yes or no, but you vote by proxy. We used to own some stock years ago, so you always see anytime they had to make a decision, then in order to get the agreement or disagreement of all shareholders in that company, then you've got to take a vote. And since you can't all come there to the company headquarters, then you vote by the proxy method. So... I guess proxy, I knew that as a child, since we were given stock by relatives when we were small children, I guess probably when we were born. So we were brought up with the term proxy, no problem to me. Proxy means that someone else or something else is standing in the place or in behalf of the person needing healing or deliverance. So the question, can demons be cast out by the proxy method? Yes, but there are several important considerations to bear in mind. Yes, demons can be driven out from a farm. But there are several important considerations to bear in mind. In the first place, it probably works best for those wanting healing or deliverance themselves, for those actually desiring healing and deliverance themselves. Now, I'm going to walk, a, I think, a scriptural line of balance here. People can get lopsided in one direction or the other saying well it's never by proxy you're always by proxy and generally the bible is going to be cautious and be somewhere in between the answer is most definitely a, a capital yes you can cast demons out from afar just like you can have a person heal at a distance but i'm going to say that according to the teaching of the word and the examples we have in the word of god deliverance by proxy as well as healing by proxy probably works best for those who really want the deliverance of the healing themselves so you say well, why not just pray for the person if they want the deliverance why not just pray for them why not to go a roundabout way and pray through someone else well the proxy method is used basically for one of two reasons either because they are unable to be present or they are incapable of believing those are the two general reasons for proxy praying according to scripture now you got to listen to that that's very important it's very important the proxy method according to the bible is generally used either because they are unable to be present in other words because of the distance 
they are unable to be present or secondly because they are incapable of believing let me give you some examples of the first situation they are unable to be present well the most obvious example is the distance is simply too great you're wanting to pray for your mother who lives in Australia or your mother let's say wants to receive prayer for deliverance and she lives in Australia well I think generally speaking unless we're somehow specially led the distance is simply too great it's not worth traveling to Australia to get somebody here we can do that right here and now by having someone stand in proxy for them so the distance is too great or another way that we could explain why they are unable to be present perhaps the nature of the possession or the nature of the sickness prevents them from being there maybe they only live next door but they're bedfast of course you could always go over there but I'm saying the nature of the demon possession or the nature of the illness may prevent the person from being there they're unable to be present we said a second reason they are incapable of believing well can you think of any cases where that might fit somebody's incapable of believing and that we would need someone to stand in proxy well what type of demons unbelief insanity what about a child or an infant an infant's incapable of believing an infant's incapable of exercising faith for deliverance from demon spirits or exercising faith for divine healing so there are many different ways in which we could say a person is either unable to be present or they are incapable of believing an insane spirit an infant a child and so forth as a result we would have proxy for instance the biblical examples would be Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 through 13 let's use that for a person who's unable to be present there the centurion has a slave and he asked for Jesus to come to his home and then he says on second thought no I believe that if you'll just speak the word that on the authority of my faith and remember Jesus said great is your faith I've not found so great faith no not on Israel the centurion stood in proxy for his slave at home Matthew 8 5 to 13 well I would assume that the slave was in such a condition that he was simply unable to be present or he would have walked there with the centurion his master and got his healing and how about a scripture for the second of those incapable of believing well in the same book Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 through 28 this Syrophoenician woman has a daughter we're not told her age but maybe she's too young to believe or in Matthew chapter 17 I don't have the verses particularly down here but Matthew chapter 17 that boy who was thrown about by this wild spirit maybe his age maybe the nature of the disease also made him incapable not of being there but of believing he was there remember he was right before Jesus the spirit tore him in the midst and threw him on the ground and he wallowed foaming but the father did the believing for the son so in either case either someone or something is put in their place whenever faith is exercised and I'm not going to get through with this tonight so we're going to take up the subject of proxy next time but let me just conclude by saying I would say generally speaking that either relatives or close friends are the best ones to do the believing Unless we're led some other way, I don't think you can just stand in for who knows who, who knows where on the other side of the globe. Or then, you know, if we carried this business of praying in proxy to an extreme, why couldn't we as a church set this whole globe free then? 